today I'll be talking about the distal humerus, why day one failure occurs, not fixing up the two columns properly. We all know distal humerus has these two columns, and this is in between, which is as actually this is the articulating surface of the distal humerus. And as all of us know, this is the angle which it creates with the 90 degree base. And these are the two columns, one column here, one column there, and this is capitulum and preclia. And these are the ones which are articulated. So what we commonly do, as all of you know, we fix this up and we fix one column fixation, second column fixation. Medial and lateral column diverge from the humeral shaft at 45 degrees. The columns are the important structures for the support of the distal humeral triangle. These are the ones which support this triangle. Now, we know about it. All these are the types of fractures which we get. If we can, this is the tie arch, lateral column, medial column. This is what we have been putting it about the medial plate and the posterior lateral plate. We all know this. Till we miss the best plate. We wish all these fractures were like this. Unfortunately, they are quite different all the time. Now, articular surface, alacronon osteotum. If you want to see this full articular surface, then the alacronon osteotum I feel is the best way in which you can do it. To see the whole alacronon fossa at almost 360 degrees by flexing the elbow, placing the joint incongruity from posterior to right anterior side. Is a reduction process. For this perfect olecrodon osteotomy is needed. Now, so many times what we have to do is when we have not done the olecrodon osteotomy, we'll see only the anterior, only the part which is seen posterior. But anterior part, you will not be able to see if there is any incongruity. It is the it is the round surface. If there is a miss, miss um, Positioning in rotation will not, not be able to pick it up unless we see the whole 360 degrees. Then only we can see the, the, the rotational part. And that's the reason this is the olecrodon osteotomy is the only one which will allow you that. Now, as we all know it very well, insert the first stabilizing K wire as a guide wire for the cannulator screw as it is. Now, when we put this guide wire, if we put a separate guide wire for the stabilizing one, think what will happen is generally when we put a first guide wire, it is right into the center and that is the one which gives us the next stability. So our attitude is always to put the first guide wire. If we put it not as a guide wire, but as a stabilizing wire, it is the one which is going to be in the perfect place. So my suggestion is insert the first stabilizing K wire as a guide wire. So then you know that if you pass it here, you will put in the cannulated screw to really immobilize this fracture from here. Otherwise, you will pass it lower down or you will pass it higher. So because generally that is the best wire which we always put in. So insert the first stabilizing K wire as a guide wire for the cannulated screw as it is the best wire for the leg screw. Insert other stabilizing wires around it. And as you can see here, first we have put in the wire through which you are going to put in the cannulated screw. Then you put in other wires in order to stabilize the columns and the distal part. Now, only other thing, what, see, as you know, in this sort of a class, I'm not going to talk about the day-to-day -day thing. I'm basically going to talk about where we can make error and how we can improve upon. So first is, this is the one which you should avoid. If you're not careful, you will pass the screw, you will go through the electron on fossa, and it will come out. As you can see here, as you can see there. Take a particular care in reassembling the condyle that the fixation device doesn't encroach on the electron on or the coronoid fossa. Standard surgeon, still why things go wrong. It's basically, this is the one which we have been doing it for a long time. Medial plate, posterior lateral plate, these are the leg screws, this is the 
uh, like colon osteotomy, which we have done, we have fixed it up. And then medial column and the lateral column and the medial column. This is the one extra screw which we put in in order to stabilize. This is very good. There is no reason about it. You can see this fracture that is stabilized like this. Now we can see this is the standard 1990 conventional plane. This is 1990 conventional plane. And this is all on osteotomy. Now, plate is applied medially through applied to avoid a posa. And this is applied posterior lateral condyle. And this is how we put it. If we do this standard surgery, well, the fracture will do well. All these are the few things which we avoid. But we get dragged into controversy of 1990 or a parallel plane. And try a new surgery and spoil both standard surgery and the new parallel plate due to lack of understanding. Now, this, this is the parallel plate which has been talked about. Here is that controversy parallel plate versus 1990 plate. Now, this parallel plate is supposed to be, as you can see here, it is on both the condyles, and every screw has to pass through the screw holes. There is no leg screw which you are not supposed to have them. You can have a temporary K wire fixation. And first is the reduction in L with this a reduction clamp. And having put this reduction clamp, put two plates on two sides. And you see that this plate, it goes through the condyle, preferably both condyle. Now, the problem at times that we have passed this through, and occasionally this screw will also hit the same screw. So you may not be able to pass all the screws. And these are the K wires and all are keeping it. And in this system, there is no first leg screw to reduce the articular surface. This is what is the one so easily done. And this is what has been advised. It's so easy to show it on this diagram in the auditorium. But when you're doing it, to hold the fragments, particularly for more communities, to hold all of them in position is always not very easy. Do it in a live surgery on terminated fragments, and then we realize it is easy only in this fracture if you are lucky to treat such. If parallel plate was not written by Mayo Clinic, it would not have got such publicity. If any one of us had written in Nasik, it would not have been spoken about even in Devlali, which is a Nasik and Devlali, which are the nearby, nearby cities in the Maharashtra. For average surgeon, stick to one of you are most complicated. Every surgeon wants to do something new. If the air, if you have a volume, and if you have a volume and you can do and try out the new surgery, that's fine. But otherwise, if you are not having a huge volume and you are doing this surgery once in a while, stick to what you are used to. Now, here are what are the what is the literature about this two What does the literature say about these two constructions? They state two different plate designs in five different configurations. For stable fixation, the plate should be placed on the separate column, but not necessarily 90 degrees to each other. They state five constructs. Strongest construct, medial construction plate with the posterior lateral dynamic compression plate. What is the evidence? JC Jupiter in 1990 versus plating this Although some biomechanical evidence may favor parallel plating. Real message is both orientations are strong enough to mobilize after the factor fixation. From clinical perspective, no sufficient data for a valid comparison. Different patient type and a fracture type were compared. So that is basically, I feel, whatever you are used to, you are used to 90 for 1990, stick it to that, you will probably do the best job. The parallel plate is not anything dramatically different or better. And there are people who are staunch followers of parallel plate, staunch followers of 1990. I feel it is your own perspective or your own bias which makes us feel, no, 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 in this fracture, parallel plate is good. I would say in every fracture, you can treat either with a parallel plate or with a 1990. I am more used to 1990. I tried out parallel plate in between, but I felt that it's not, I'm not as comfortable as 1990. So I stick on to 1990 all the time.
Now here is the one column. Even that one column, the surgeon messed it up. You can see there are no screws. There's only one screw like this. So this is again going into non -tubing. There was a one condition. This can be easily salvaged with K wire and a pen. Simplest situation. Even one column was messed up, could be salvaged by simple this K wire. Now, here you can see the surgeon was a miser surgeon, fixed up on the medial side like this, posteriorly only, not even a medially what we talk about. And then on the lateral side, on the sorry, on the lateral side, posteriorly, the medial side. He put only this one screw. This is all what is supposed to work. One screw is not enough to fix up the medial side or the left. So this one screw, this is fragment too small, and this is what was ultimately ended into non-union. Now you can see this is too small a fragment. So in the, this is before the days of the locking plates arrived. This is where I was treated in. Still today, I may treat the same way. This is the one which was treated by these two K wire and the circlage wire going from one side to other side. In nine months, it has held up very well. So this sort of a short, this sort of a fracture where the distal fragment is very short, where the plates will hold only one screw and all. You know, particularly in osteoporotic fractures, this is a good system. You can see the range of movement and nine months cheaper option, both column fixed. This is again the second case, but it's such a small column. Again, tension man with K wire and the things are again in that. The bones are too porotic, locking plate also does not hold. This is the one which has been described in the literature. It is what is fixing up the two condyles, two K wires fixing it up. This K wire. The precaution is these two K wires. Now it should come out. You have to keep it out long enough on which you can put in the tension band wire. Not too long so that it keeps, uh, so that it hurts. So both of them have to be slightly long where you can put in the wire. And you can see the wire is put in on the same side. This is not the real tension band principle, but this is the one which really immobilizes these two columns which are lower down very well. Those who have done this, they will swear by this. This is a wonderful thing. And um, I think all of us have tried it out and all of us have succeeded in using this sort of a system. Dr. Chando, I think you have spoken about this often enough. Well, would you like to talk about it a little in your experience? Uh, it, it works wonderfully. One, there are two or three important things. When the combination is too much and we are not able to get any hold with any of these screws, then this technique works best. What you need to do is to put two transverse K wires or two transverse screws as is been shown in the diagram so that the intercondylar is very nicely made. And then two K wires from the side crossover. I take two screws rather than going very high up and uh, threading onto the come out of the K wire. Rather than that, I take two traditional screws. Uh, it becomes more easier. Only thing we need to take is one of the wire tries on the medial side, tries to possibly engulf the ulna nerve. So we have to just gently put one circlage wire beneath the ulna nerve so that it is flush to the bone. That is the only precaution we have to take. And this allows early mobilization. That is one definite advantage. Union is almost assured. Same comminuted fracture, if you put a locking plate, many times you would get disruption of screw and plate and a non-union. But this construct works very well. Absolutely. And you are surprised at time uh, to get a fantastic range of movement. As I said, all of us who have used it, we are extremely happy with this. And even at times, I have used it for a slightly higher fracture also. Like here, you can see, this is not that low a fracture. Even for a higher fracture also, it gives you a good stability. So in porotic bones, this alternative fixation, this is the ideal thing. I don't think that is any, any question about it. Now here, this is Dr. Nagy's case. You can see the badly communicated fracture. What I'm trying to show here is, 
unless you have the olecranon or osteotomy, you will not be able to see this. Cochlear combination fixed with two of uh, AYS. One can never see this much without the olecranon osteotomy. And that's the reason the olecranon osteotomy, I feel in an intra-articular fracture, olecranon osteotomy is the most important thing, which I would all the time think of doing. And here you can see, he has so beautifully he has fixed it up, such bad fracture, he has fixed up with two columns, three plates, one and three plates. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, olecranon also he has fixed it up in this K wires. Ultimately, the whole thing, which was combination of plate, tension band, wires, and this is nine months, and you can see such a beautiful result for such a badly combinated fracture. So if you do a good job, you will always get an excellent result. Now, this olecron or osteoton. And now, again, if you go into the meetings, all of us have our own option. Some people will say, I never do an intra-articular osteoton. Like some people will say, I only do this extra-articular osteoton. And some of them, they say, I'll do only non-osteotomy approach. For every factor, I can handle this. Now, I feel this is an individual variation. Whatever you want to believe, there is no results on the knee. Everybody has spoken about this is the best osteotomy for intra-articular factors. Now, whether you want to do this, whether you want to do this, or you want to try it out, again, as I said, unless you have a huge volume turnover, don't try many different things. Do a tick to one point, and the safest is this osteotomy. For intra-articular fracture, you know, reduction in intra-articular osteotomy at the olecranon notch, osteotomy gives excellent visibility of the anterior most part of the joint, as I earlier told you. Let those who want to experiment do it. One should stick to one osteotomy unless a very high volume surgeon where you can do two, three things complete. This is what has been described. Chevron type osteotomy is preferred to give a better and more stable bony contact during the repair of the electron reduction. Larger surface improves the bone healing and the shape improves the rotation. Now here, PrEP versus electron osteotomy. The results. Osteotomy better results in comminuted factor. 40 percent are three, four parts severely comminuted factor. PrEP better in a two part simple factor. But our assessment of fracture being a simple two part may be wrong. Here is another case by Nagy. You can see it very well. It appears to me this is the medial column and the lateral column. This is the fracture. Which is there. But see, he has so beautifully demonstrated. Are you there, Asif? Yes, sir. He took, took a traction view and then suddenly realized that this is what was appeared to be a non-articular fracture. is now a perfect articular fracture with this combination. So this traction you showed that. So now you can see this is the one which is commutated fracture. One, two, three, which is badly commutated fracture now. So olecranon osteotomy. You can see this is olecranon osteotomy. And now only you could see all the pieces. Temporary fixed it up, holding it up. You can see these two clamps are holding this commutated fracture. Assemble those jigsaw puzzle, posterior plate, medial plate. And ultimately this is what is the things and he has got this excellent result after. So I, what I say is, if you want to see the perfect reduction, I feel olecranon osteotomy, intra-articular fracture is a must. I have never treated without any osteotomy. Now, sir, may I add something? Yes. Uh, there is a... Yeah, I think this is your case. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, there is a paper saying that all three pieces can be kept on the table and at least in the upper limb reconstituted very well without any issues in the long term. So, you have a case like it, I think, if I remember. Yeah, articular congruity is most important. Plus, this trochlea was almost hollow. So, large amount of cancellous uh, graft from anterior crest could be packed into that. Huge volume we could really pack into that trochlea. Mm -hmm. And there is a lost K wire also seen here. Here. Yeah. No plaster was given. Yeah. That's beautiful.
Now I talk about a little about the osteotum. This incision which goes around the olecranon, chevron type or the inverted chevron or chevron, whatever you decide. This is, this is the standard. Sometimes the factor can be said that the reverse chevron osteotomy is preferred. Now what is recommended is you go at that level, at the mid shaft, at the mid articular surface level and pass an oscillating saw this much. Use the fine oscillating saw to divide only up to the three quarters of the depth of the board. And then it is the thin osteotom you take and go right up to the end. Chisel and use the chisel on the last part of the bone, but only just short of a subchondral bone. Remember that the central ridge of the olecranon, which is very strong, will need to be divided deeper using a very narrow bladder osteotome. And then he says, and then break the bone by manipulation. This maintains the irregular surface for a better refuturing. This is what is believed. Any one of you want to do, how do you do this osteotomy before I come in? A same olecranon osteotomy, this is what has been talked about. That mm -hmm. I'm talking about the mainly, mainly oscillating saw, a short of a breakage, and the last bone break the bone by manipulation. This maintains the irregular surface. Will you carry on, both of you, like this? Yes, sir. So almost, almost same. Rather, uh, the only difference is I don't use a saw. I use two osteotomes, very thin, very sharp, from two angles. They converge onto the uh, place where we want to do the osteotomy. And then, as you said, we lift both the osteotomes up so that it suddenly cracks, creating an uneven surface, which, which leaves a cartilage non-communicated and it doesn't damage the inside uh, cartilage of the trochlea. Yes, Asif, you want to add up anything? Yeah, I use a thin oscillating saw for almost 90-95% of the part. And uh, there is a gauze piece always beneath the uh, olecran article between the articular surface of humerus and uh, olecran, and I do a chevron, and I crack the last part. But as right uh, last time you rightly pointed out, if you leave too much of hard cancellous bone there, the osteotomy is not really a good one, and it doesn't give you adequate vision. So you have to use either sharp osteotome, as Dr. Chandak said, or thin oscillating, almost just beneath the cartilage. Right. Yeah, this is what I do. Yeah. This is what I experience. Yeah. You, do, you do a partial and try to break it. If it breaks like this, now the whole thing, the visibility mm -hmm. of the osteotomy here, it will be very poor. You want it exactly to be like this. So it goes all the way there. So what I have modified is, I put, as Asim mentioned rightly to me, I put a gauze piece or a small, small metal here. Inside, inside the joint and go almost 99% there and then practice. I do not really try to manipulate and I do not even mind at times going all the way 100% either with a thin osteotome, not with the oscillating saw, but thin osteotome is that, that all the way. Yes, Asim, you want to add Some, up the... Somebody is holding the al proximal ulna and pulling it away from the humerus. That's right. There is better visibility of the articular surface. So that this, all these things will not damage. If your osteotome goes further, it will not damage here. My choice that I mentioned this. Now fixing up the osteotome. These are the two ways in which it has been fixed up. The repairing the osteotomy, two K wires, and this either a double loop or a single loop. This is what has been recommended. I'll come to the minor point of that fixation. Surgical tips. Two smooth K wires, 1.6 to 2 millimeter inserted from the proximal olecranon transverse fracture line and engage the anterior ulna cortex. Greater resistance to wire migration. Now, this is what is we all do it. Passing it through the anterior cortex so that it doesn't back out. If this is the one which we have passed intramedullary, it has a tendency to back out. And even if this is the one which we try to go out posteriorly, but this will be too, it will be too superficial and then this is not the ideal one. This is the ideal one. 
Now here, this is what has been recommended, approximately 40 millimeter distal to the fracture line. 40 millimeter. And 5 millimeter uh, anterior from posteriorly, this is the area in which you make a drill hole in order to pass the tension wire. Minimum distance from the fracture should not be less than 20. Minimum should be 20. And it shouldn't go very much nearby. 20 to 40 is the ideal distance. Nobody, I feel generally, not many people will go all the way to 40. 20 to 30 is a reasonable area in which we will go. Now, this is the drill which you go, reduction, fixation, all around. 2.5 millimeter drill, make a coronal hole in the proximal ulna, ulna to radial side to pass the figure of eight wire. And then pass the wire. If you are making a double loop, then this, this is the loop wire will be nearer here. Repair eight millimeter wire when making the loop approximately one third along its length. Insert the shorter segment of the wire through this payload. Now, few things to be avoided. Identify the posterior medial range of the electronon. 30 degree ulnar angulation avoids the impingement of the wire on the radius, supinator and the bicep tendon. Any radial angulation of the wire in relation to the landmark was found to be unacceptable. This is the radius, so the wire should go from here to the ulnar side. If the wire goes from here to the radial side, it can impinge on the radius and the, and the supinator muscle, as you say. I'll come to that. Now, here you can see, in this view, you can see it going out on the ulnar side. Now, here, this is the patient, which I show in the same presentation just now. The surgeon had done this, and you see this wire. It's going radially. You can see this is radially. It's going radially. But this has come out of the bone. So actually, where it went out, here you, here you can see. It has come out here. It should come out only on the ulnar side. And this is where it has come out. This is where the head of the radius, which I opened up, this is where I could feel the wire. And in supination pronation, you will hear the kit, 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 that this wire hitting onto the radius. This is the one which has to be avoided completely. This is, you can see in the CT scan, it is hitting onto the radius there. And so it was changed afterwards after the surgery. The full pronation and supination should be checked after the wires are inserted. K wire penetration mirror. Anterior metaphysics with triangular lateral X ray can be misleading. Penetration is underestimated in the ordinary post operative C arm view. So after engaging the second cortex, and wires are slightly backed out and bend 180 degrees over the tension bed. Like if you come out and came it out, because once you bend it out, you're going to push it back. Fracture is reduced, wires are out, one centimeter out, and then it comes out. This is the tension bend, and the wires are more useful to be put in behind the triceps. Now, here it is. You can see this is the situation. They are behind the muscle, proximally and distally. And the same thing is better in the patella. Generally, the people try to do it around this K wires here and K wires here. This is not an ideal situation. So it should, if it goes behind the tendo, tendo muscular junction, then it's a much better situation. What is recommended is make a small cut into the triceps tendon. Pass the wires now, pass the tendon bend things and uh, suture it out. And then, having bent the tension bend under the triceps, put it under the triceps. And then, afterward, you push this inside the triceps. This you put it inside the fashion. Now, the, whether the tension bend goes around this wire or it goes around this osteotendinous junction, it doesn't make a difference. But what people used to do, put the wire here and put the wire and tension bend from here, this is what is not ideal or this is not what is better. Now, when you can put in, you can put in two, with the plier, you can put in two bands and tighten it. You two K knots. Uh, produce symmetrical tension in the practice site and gives more rigid fixation than using a single knot. But somehow, I am more used to this Harris wire type because I used this and I found that sometimes the slackness of this doesn't go away so regularly. 
And so I use the wire tightener, had it wire tightener, and I find tensioning with this plier leaves at times a loop, which is not strangled, which is not straightened. I use one knot, but use the tension wire with which is Harris tire wire, uh, Harris uh, wire type. This is the one which is an Indian uh, Indian copy of the um, of the foreign instrument, and I find it far more easier to use. You can use any of these other ones. There's a different thing. I am not very fond of the screw fixation on which to do a wire. Because this screw fixation, you can see the screw fixation ultimately when it goes in. If it is too tight, it will not go further. If it is too loose, you will not get a completion. And as you can see it very well here, the screw fixation goes here, but it goes slightly on the side and it will open up. And the screw fixation is Everything depends on the thread fixing it up inside. So that's the reason the screw fixation is not an ideal thing for me. Here you can see the screw was tight. When you started the tensioning, this is will open up. Because this will not allow the tensioning to occur and it will open up. You can see this has also opened up. So this is not the ideal thing. I do not like the screw fixation all the time. It is a hit and a miss for me. Compression depends on the screw fit in the proximal and not. If too tight, distraction too loose, no compression. When the tension wire is put, since screw is not going forward, it is too tight. It backs out on the compression and when it is tightened, again there is a distraction. So this is what is the thing which you talk about it. The screw here is a, is a different thing. We are talking about the screw here. So this is what is the screws. I do not like the screw fixation here. And you can see this is how the screw is. And intraoperative fluoroscopy must evaluate the final reduction for the cell of the KY. Stability of the fixation, impingement of the hardware must be evaluated taking the elbow through the full range of movement. Elbow movement should be smooth without scraping, grating, or clicking. This is how it should be. As you can see here, it shouldn't be so much out. In pronation, biceps to binal muscles are in contact with the anterior metaphysical of the arm and protrusion of the 2 to 3 meters may cause a significant impingement. Neurovascular damage, restricted forearm rotation, or inside a hypertrophic ossification or as a radiolosteinosis. So, all these are the ways in which you do it. These are the few things which I mentioned about intra articular, extra articular. Now, here you can see. I am not very fond of this screw. As you can see, it is getting out. Even there is a washer is not touching it. So it is not going forward. This screw is bites on the canal. Now here you put in the surgeon. He put the screw and then put the tension band here. The screw is supposed to be the compression screw which has not been able to do it. The tension band alone is not doing it because it's not giving you the uniform pressure onto the osteopathy. So delayed union, non-union fixation, failure, infection, and symptomatic hardware for me. This is the reason why the people who do not do the osteotomy, they talk about it, that osteotomy is not is not as good, uh, and you, you shouldn't do the osteotomy, or they choose not to osteotomy. I think if you do this electron and osteotomy and fix it up properly, I feel the non-union rate in osteotomy is very, very insignificant. The Chevron osteotomy, everything, digitally directed Chevron osteotomy gives excellent access to the most complicated fracture, distal intraarticular fracture of the humerus. Large surface area, better bone to bone healing, Chevron improves the rotation stability. Trap relies on tendon to bone healing, which is inferior to bone to bone healing. And now, now I think I'll stop here. <laughs> Faculty to do IR, we'll Sir, aren't you using mic today because volume? Sorry? Sir, aren't you using mic today? Volume is towards lower side. Aye, aye, aye. Thank you for reminding me. No, oh, it is good. But rather it is good actually, Harjo. Uh, is your computer volume button low? Just check. <laughs> okay, sir, I will check. We can we can hear normally. That yeah. is a normal. Sir. Anyway, anyway, sir. Uh, Ashim and uh, Chandak, 
do you want to add yeah. or track from the osteotomy or like osteotomy which we talked about as you i said, want i want to show detail two three slides sorry i want to show two three slides how to make a perfect u of the k wire and hammer it right way i have documented it please please keep it ready yeah. so if you allow me to share then i will share yeah. this it is useful please share it yeah it is very useful or i go further yeah Chandav, do you want to add up anything? Uh, no, sir. Exactly seeing uh, your presentations many, many years back, we have almost uh, imbibed all of these good qualities of a uh, olecranon osteotomy and touch wood till so far I have not faced a non-union of olecranon and rather uh, hardly any problem. All things are meticulously to be followed. The only occasional thing can be possibly prominence of the K-wires as the healing goes on, the edema goes on decreasing. That is the only thing. And the K-wire is supposed to go inside the all. Right. That is very important. Right. Very that important. Not come out. Yeah. Yeah, that's in Petri's yeah. carry uh, You pass the two 1.8 mm K-wire, not very thick. Don't take two mm or bigger K-wires. You need... Wires which are strong enough but yet flexible enough to allow you to bend them properly. Just bite the anterior cortex the moment anterior cortex gives way, you stop. Maybe take help of IRTV to check that you have not gone too far. Two K wires of 1.8. Then I put my chuck on this. I do the rest of the things as Dr. Tanna showed that you make a loop and other things. This is the last step of completing the operation. Uh, the synthesis chuck is there, is flush on the soft tissue. Then I withdraw calculated millimeters. This is about seven, eight millimeters. This distance is measured here. How much you have withdrawn so that the wire doesn't become short. It still bites the anterior cortex when you hammer it. We know that where we have clamped this. So at that point, I hold it with a uh, nose plier here. Somebody is using a wire bender to bend it. This is half the U here. Then this is how you get once. Turn it 180 degree. Turn it slightly little more, but you don't get a perfect 180 degree U. For that, you have to use this strong nose plier and now you have got a perfect U. Then you turn it as Dr. Tanna showed you, make a slit in the triceps there. Through the slit, you turn it 180 degree on this side proximally, and then you just hammer it. So your length, which has gone up to the anterior cortex has not changed, and you've got a nice good U. Do the same thing for the other wire. So if you really hammer this wire in the bone, chances that they will back out are almost negligible. Plus another thing last time in one of my non-union osteotomies are pointed out that you should not try to go too close to here. From Starting from here, you should try to come out here. If this distance is short, then probably it's not that stable. So start at this point, but try to bite the anterior cortex here and not very close to the coronoid. You stay at least an inch or maybe a little more away here and then bite. Thank you, sir. <coughs> yes, Chandok, you want to add up anything here? No, Even sir. Dr. Sangeet, Dr. Garikone, are you around? So some... I'm driving. <laughs> sir, just a tip, if you can hear me. Yes, uh, we are hearing you. The, what, what Dr. Asim recommended, uh, that withdrawing the K wire uh, that should not be practiced in an elderly osteoporotic because that wire will always be uh, loose if you withdraw it from the opposite cortex and then try to hammer it. That will lose the hold in an osteoporotic bone. In a young adult, it is all right. It is the one uh, what he recommended should be practiced. That is the only tip I want to add. Yeah. Good point. Good. Yeah. So don't, don't lose the grip of the K wire. Yeah. 
and and that and that is true for everywhere wherever you are putting it whether it is for proximal humerus or uh, any other bone in a elderly if you withdraw it that becomes uh, 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 very loose uh, then you have to change the direction and try to get a newer uh, far But, cortex hold sangeet i have a counter to that if i can mention that yes kvr you are while drilling you are rotating the kvr yes right? by rotating yes. it enters the opposite quarter yes right so what dr negi is doing is he is just reverse rotating till till 2 or 3 mm still is out is not out of the second cortex he, yes. he is 2 mm there and then he is hammering back so i i think this technique is fine the incidence what i'm saying is the incidence of migration in a, of the k wires are very high that yes. is uh, it comes out uh, uh, when you do that that is when you penetrate withdraw it and again try to penetrate the far cortex no no that no, is what not, i'm pointing no no i got the point he is not withdrawing completely from the second cortex what sir, you mean sir in 3 mm withdrawing what can you do you cannot bend the tip of the k wire am i right asim you have to withdraw it sufficiently so that you can get a 180 degree bend and then you can hammer it again i think yes that is the sir i think he has got a point okay agreed probably has got a point yeah so next time i'm going to get finally uh -huh. pictured what is happening and we'll see mm -hmm. चांडर सर बट एक्चुअली एओ मैनुअल इज नॉट स्पेसिफिक फॉर अ ओल्ड पर्सन और अ यंग पर्सन बट इट मेंशंस दैट यू मेक इट टू एम एम होल फॉर द पैसेज ऑफ वायर एंड देन यू जस्ट पास 1.8 पॉइंट एट एम एम दैट इज द ओरिजिनल एओ मैनुअल डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ अ टेंशन बेंट इट डजेंट हैव टू बी रियली टाइट फिटिंग इट ओनली गिवस रोटेशनल स्टेबिलिटी एंड द कॉम्प्रेशन अचीव इज बाय द मेकेजम ऑफ टेंशन बेंट Yeah. Oh, oh. This is what the actual uh, second and third volume of the AO manual uh, suggested. Agreed. Two mm agreed. and then a K wire of one point eight. Yeah, agreed. All K wires do not back out. It is only a small percentage of K wire which backs out. So Sangeet has a point that if, if you are withdrawing too much, yeah, yes, they can back out. Yeah, probably. Agreed, Sangeet. And other thing is. Uh, whenever you are hammering that always take a incision in the triceps tendon yeah which you should which you should okay. and suture. and suture suture that incision suture that for uh, the aponeurosis yes another good point sangeet is that uh, this fellow jupiter he because this knot is very prominent if you use a very strong stainless steel wire so what he does is he takes slightly thinner wires but makes two loops so the knot okay. is I, i was listening to him about two months back so somebody said that you are still doing that so he was laughing that i don't change every year i continue doing the same thing which has worked in my hands for 30 years yes so sangeet you are you are driving no i no i'm going i have reached home i'll be joining again from the laptop in 5 minutes i don't want you to get involved much yeah no 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 sir no sir i have reached that fine there is a question in chat box how to use harris wire tightener i will have to show him a video uh how to i i try to explain if i can that's not given in the book chandak sir <laughs> Not given. Ah, uh, is not given in the book. How to use it? That wire tends to slip. Yeah. No, 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 no. It doesn't slip. I no, no. We, we know how to make it not to slip, but that you have to learn by uh, hit and try. <laughs> it is learned on the stalls on the corner. Con on the stalls are in the OT. Yeah, <laughs> I think basically. you put the wire here by 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 opening this first when you when you put them away 
there will be a gap here. When you tighten, when you tighten, the wire will be held in a grip here. And once you tighten, it will be. Now you go on more and more tightening, so these two things will go on apart. Once this tightens, they go apart. So automatically you will get the tension, and then all the if ever there is any any slack or laxity, it will be all covered up. And I always go back to the sea. I mean, see whether I have not put any loop or any any laxity in between. And once you have done this, and if you see the osteotomy area or whatever, and then you will be able to realize that the osteotomy has very well jammed up. If it is not jammed up, there is somewhere there is a loop which you have not been able to remove, remove it. I think it is a little, uh, it, it needs a little practice, but I, I am so used to this. Now it is available in quite a few of the Indian stalls. Mm -hmm. Sir, one other point is that, sir, no, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah, you, can you show the lateral there, Holikran? Last slide. Any lateral elbow car? Yeah, any, uh, yeah. This hole should be in the midline, mid axial line of the ulna. Generally, people tend to make it very close to the dorsal cortex. So, when you flex the elbow, it may tend to open on the anterior surface here, near the uh, uh, cartilaginous surface, articular surface. So, Hole in the ulna should be in the mid axial line. Now you see here, the wire is going from here to here. Yeah, it's going pretty long. Yeah. The way Dr. Asim mentioned, wire, if it is going here, that means you are starting from there. So now you are going obliquely onto the fracture site. So that is the one where if you will not get the perfect compression there. So that, that point which Asim mentioned is very important. It should go. Far too, uh, it has to go slightly more distally. It is very, if you go too distally, it will not bite the opposite. Bite. So it is a, it's a compromise. You will have to get the gut feeling. And when it is going, you should know that it is going to hit the cortex. If it is going here, then you know that it is not going to hit the cortex. Okay, friends. Any other questions before we proceed further? See, all these are the small things which is very important to learn. Now, here was the fracture. You can see this was a fracture. Plate too short on both sides. Plate should have been unequal plate and longer plate. So this gave way. Plate <coughs> <coughs> removed and removal of surgeon was not equipped to refix. Correct. Now you can see preoperatively I saw an excellent range of elbow movement. And he had this small angulation which was there, deformity was there. So I operated upon and uh, I did this, these pieces were very small. Somehow or the other, I felt that the plate will not hold. So I put in these two tension band wires and they are a little uh, shorter. I, I could have gone slightly more away and fixed it up, fixed up the whole thing and started mo mobilizing. On the table, I didn't check whether there was a movement with there or not there. Pregnant was small and, and I remember very distinctly she had some anesthesia problem. So we were in a hurry to finish the whole thing. So the way it was done and it started mobilizing and the whole thing gave out. It gave way. Once it gave way, obviously it needed a second surgery, a third surgery. Now I realized that it was the stiff elbow when tried to mobilization made the construct unstable. So second operation I went, I did the locking plate in 1990, fixed up the thing, put up a good amount of bone graft there. And this is ending up at the same level, which is not good. I think it should end up at the unequal level. 
And then at the end of the surgery, I saw the movement and I realized there was no movement at the elbow, which probably after the tension man wires, I had not done it. So I now I went down intra-articular and mobilized the elbow so that the elbow at the end of the operation was at least moving up to up to 90 degrees. And so the, I really mobilized it, mobilized the stiff elbow and fix the plates and screws. And then this is the result you can see at the end of our uh, total four years after the after the accident, about six months after the second surgery, good supination, pronation, and a good flexion extension you can see here. So lesson learned, stiff elbow needs surgical mobilization after fixation to relieve, relieve the strain on the new construct. Now here was again badly comminuted fracture. I put in the thin plate here. And I felt at the moment that this is not giving me enough stability. So I added up these two K wires. This added up this K wire. And then I felt everything went on well. And then the fracture ended up into a good function and everything. Now here, day one, fall fracture, conserved. Fall fracture, you can see that here it is slightly more anteriorly. Whatever is normally this condyle should be. This is on day one. This is day one. And this is, you can see, on four months. Four months, which is quite a lot there. This was day one, and this is what it is today. And then we realized this fracture, which was there, should have been given more importance. Surgeon had not done anything to that fracture. So here it is CT is a must, it is underutilized. And then the full assessment of the fracture could not have been done. Solution is by a CT of your clinic, if in case you have any problem. What I find by people arguing is, if I send the patient from my clinic to the city clinic, on the way I may lose the patient. And that's the reason why they do not get a CT done. And then probably they compromise on the treatment. Here you can see, this is four months when she came. This is what was the range of movement, hardly any. And you can see the CT scan. The whole condyle has been uh, ball, ball position and united. And he, at this stage, I offered her a surgery. Somehow the other she refused. And uh, if she only... I think about this slight fracture. Dr. Sangeet and Dr. Asim have a wonderful presentation, which they will do it after this. Now here, these are the slight fracture, one and a half month old. When I did the CT scan, you see it was badly shattered. When I opened up, I felt it was not repairable. Fortunately, it was only the capitulum which was gone. The broccoli I was perfectly all right, so I excised it. So it is possible to excise it in such situations. But in a fresh case, it hardly ever used to excise. Now here is the, again, somebody had fixed it up like this without really reducing it. Uh, unless you reduce it properly, you can see this is the fracture way it is. All these slight fractures are very important. I'm just, I'm just showing you a few of them which have been badly treated, which you take over, and then whether you want to correct them or no, there's different things. Molecular osteotomy to access the intra-articular piece is very helpful. And the piece can be well fixed with a Herbert screw. Or you can take a lateral view, I mean, an approach which is lateral or a medial, wherever it, that your slice is. Or even if you take molecular osteotomy, life becomes a little more easier. You can see this is the one, you can fix it up without the, which is only the lateral approach. And you can, if there is only one sided, you will be able to fix it up only with the lateral approach. And here you can see this slice which is there. This is CT scan. You can see there is badly displayed. This is the way it is. And then how to fix olecranon osteotomy. If this is olecranon osteotomy, you can see now completely if you see this is olecranon osteotomy, you can see the slice which has been put back, reduced, clamped. This is the K-wire which is holding it temporarily. 
who gave our holding them temporarily. You can see these four parts. And then the uh, Herbert screws on this, four Herbert screws are fixing it up, fixed up, so future back to like one of your problems. So strategies to avoid complications, painted K wire, pin cable system, it said no difference in mechanical strength. Tension bed with K wire having the eyelet, simple figure of eight without the use of a K wire. This isolated capital of fracture is very poorly treated. Most have obsession of before surgery or it is, it is missed all the time. You can see them, they are badly treated most of the time. Any idea? I think I have shown this to people. Any idea what is this? Anybody wants to guess? Nobody. Radial head fractures. Uh, Radial head fractures. Radial head fracture. Yeah, there you can see that very well. You can see this was only the radial head fracture. It is initially it appears that there is a medial condyle, there is a lateral condyle, it is like this was just a radial head fracture and it was a stable one, so it was removed, just a curiosity. Now here is the a severe therapy patient. Eh? No, no, it's my patient. Right? No, sir. It's not. Uh, this is the patient which I inherited three days first surgery. Surgeon did these two screws. Well, like this was fixed up, that is not much of an issue. He did the two screws for this fracture. The two screws went on for a non union, this is two and a half months. So the same surgeon went down, this is two and a half months, perfect non union, which you can see. Same surgeon went there and did this sort of a white plate. You can see here is the fracture, there is hardly any fixation of the distal fragment. So I do not know why in the radiological he felt he has fixed it up. But he could take an AP view, I think. This is what it is. This is the stage I inherited. <laughs> and this was the CT scan which I did. Again, it was a Patka non union. So I went down and I did this double plating for that. It fixed up the fracture. This is all I could on osteotomy. You can see at the end of the, when I'm fixing it up, I'm holding them in position and I'm putting the wire. And here is the two things which I have put in. And you can see the wires are going all otherwise. And this is what it is. You can see this is the wires which are going. No wire is going on the radial side. So here was the fix. This was the leg screw and two plates. And this is how it was ultimately. It held up very well. You can see the perfect nailing which is there. And here is the range of movement with the patient as well. Now, this is the sort of a lower one third radius, uh, so lower one third humerus. This is the metaphysical plate, which is very, very well done. And this metaphysical plate, you can see where it is positioned. And it is the fracture held up and everything. But the patient had this prominent plate all the time, which was a major problem which the patient had. This should have ended up here. This is where the plate should have ended up. Unfortunately, the surgeon didn't realize at that time and it ended up there. So this is where if it ends up, it has no issue at all. So here it is, even this ordinary plate, which you can see how much it is jutting out. It is the one which was giving a problem. So when you put a plate, you got to see that intraoperatively after the fraction, that is not jutting out, it is not giving a problem. Here was the patient, I did the plating and then all three cases had to be removed and unfortunately radial now could be saved. The cunning trick, cunning trick which I am talking about is, if you are removed this plate and you have to dissect out the radial now, then you got to see that the radial now is intact. But so many times playing around with the radial now, it can get temporarily paralyzed. So I've been talking about this cunning trick. At the end of the operation, give a pocket splint. 
and you see it at the end of operation for the flint is there. You see on the next day whether he can extend the PIP joint. Uh, so he can extend the MP joint. He is only extending the PIP joint, but he has not been able to extend the MP joint. Then you know it's a palsy. But if you extend the MP joint, now you know that the radial nerve has been saved. So now you don't need the plaster. So the, initially the plaster is given and you do not commit how long you will give. And then you talk about it, the plaster now for three days when the pain has subsided, you remove the plaster. If there is a radial nerve, you give the plaster for six, you need the plaster for six weeks and continue with the plaster. By that time, the neuroplexia of the radial nerve will recover. This is a cunning trick in order to keep the patient not, not talking about that kya ho gaya, kya ho gaya, kya ho gaya. Now here was, this is the patient which I treated it and then the plate was on the one side. So I, I had to remove the plate and I broke the bone in between. So on the table, I went there, treated this, put in the new plate and the whole long plate which was put in. And so this sort of a thing, intraoperative fracture, I couldn't remove the plate which was the Indian plate. I couldn't remove it and I had the problem. Fortunately, plate plate became too proud and was prominent, opened up the wound while removing the Indian locking plate, broke the humeral staff, so did the fixation of the fracture with the plate, tension man and for time. And as if nothing has happened, patient went back to normal. So basically, basically intra-op, if you get a complication, don't get flustered. Just go back and stitch it up and do whatever needs to be done. And for that, you got to have all the hardware available to you when you are operating. That is the only way in which you will be able to do on the table whatever you need to do. Any questions here? Otherwise, I request Dr. Sangeet and Dr. Asim to put about the slice fracture. Sangeet, you want to take up first or you want to let, relax for a while? Let, let Asim. Asim? Yes. Uh, sir, one comment about the radial now. Yeah, hold up, hold up. Uh, sir, <clears throat> before, by chance, if it, uh, your case, my case or anyone's case, if that patient has a radial nerve, uh, what is conveyed to you before the surgery is, uh, you are operating a case of fracture humerus. And suppose he gets a radial nerve palsy. Now, the resident conveys you, sir, oh, 422 pe patient hai aapka radial nerve palsy ka. Okay, and that is in front of the sister, ward boys, OT staff, and everybody. So the diagnosis of that patient changes to radial nerve palsy, and that is conveyed to everybody. Uh, what, if your resident is conveying on the phone, sir, wo radial nerve palsy wala. Okay. <laughs> so if you are going to the patient, in front of the patient, uh, Sir, this is a case if your junior is introducing the patient as, Sir, this patient has a radial nerve palsy. Now, if that is, you know, like that is what is the diagnosis to the patient and they become alarmed. We all know that it, they are going to 90%, they are going to recover in about six weeks time. But the patient meanwhile searches what is radial nerve palsy and then we are all in a mess. So that practice uh, if you know it is a diagnosis, either you stop your resident to talk in front of the patient and instead of seeing or mobilizing the patient, only one thing he does in his round is mobilize his fingers and make the patient, if you, mobile, if you don't do anything and only do that, the resident goes to the room and he does ask him to patient to move the finger. So patient is, um, your fracture is here in the humerus and you are asking the patient repeatedly to move the fingers as if it is going to recover in 24 hours. <laughs> so patient, instead of, uh, you know, like how is the pain in the humerus, whether you can move the shoulder, whether you can move the elbow, that is all neglected. All everybody checks is whether his finger is going to move in 24 hours or not. So that should not be practiced and that should not be, you know, like, uh, we don't convey the residents, we don't convey our uh, OT or our hospital staff not to discuss, not to make the patient move his finger repeatedly and don't, don't uh, talk about that radial nerve palsy at all. And, 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 and therefore, 
above elbow cock up plaster <laughs> but even if you do that see the residents are not intelligent enough your paramedical staff is not intelligent enough they are going to check only that they are not going to see the wounds okay is there or not they are not going to mobilize the patient they are only going to mobilize the fingers <laughs> so i think what what they need is a briefing yes from the senior yeah. surgeon education yeah patient the the patient handling education so what is called as two minutes stand up interview so two minutes stand up interview before the round uh, solves that problem i think that's easy to solve and i think it is always wise to tell a patient that we are going in the radial now area your fracture is so bad that we will have to will have to take the nerve around so you may get a temporary palsy once you have told him or you you written down on the paper at least he takes it a little more kindly rather than so harshly yes always wise sir i have to share an experience okay. of mine on the radial third revision on the shaft the non union wise and i told the patient get it third time i am going so you will probably get a temporary radial palsy as sir unko pehli tape bhi i had had it first time also i had had it second time also so i know it will recover and when it didn't get it when i operated it didn't get it now aap you did the jadu and it didn't even get the radial palsy both the times in palsy that <laughs> If you tell him, I think they are a little more um, acceptance of prepare. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, sir, I have sir, to share one experience. Uh, I have to share one experience of mine with this uh, radial nerve palsy in regard to this. I had one patient in uh, uh, in my initial days of practice uh, uh, with shaft of humerus fracture. So I fixed with the anterior lateral approach in uh, uh, with narrow DCP. so it ultimately it went for a hypertrophic non union and implant failure uh, and uh, strangely she had a radial nerve palsy with that so i had i had to uh, change that implant and uh, during the second surgery i found that the uh, it was uh, the radial nerve was engulfed in the hypertrophic callus so i had i had to free that uh, radial nerve and then i put a posterior posterior plate in that patient and luckily that patient came uh, to me with for implant removal just a few days back so she had a very good function of the radial nerve also the implant uh, the fracture united well after the second surgery uh, since it was uh, in my initial days i could not uh, get all the documents for that otherwise uh, i would have presented that so, so, so sarab you removed the implant or you asked patient to carry on No, no, sir. I removed the implant because somehow it got Why? infected. It got infected oh. after three or four years. Oh. Okay. Good, good, good. Their contribution. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Sir, sir uh, I want to add one thing. Hello. Uh, what? It. I remember in Nair Hospital OPD also. If resident is going to do it, the questions are used to start. How will you drape the patient? so most people really do not bother to keep full shoulder inside their operative field and not many people take about 8 inches long incision going bang up to proximal end where you can split two heads of uh, triceps with your finger dissection nicely and start seeing radio that longer incision very thorough knowledge of anatomy even revision day before and when you are using a longer plate then now i simply don't dissect the now i just have to look at the now it is under my vision all the time but i'm just tunneling my periosteum and the plate beneath the now it is not really uh, touched much all through the surgery It's sort of bypass beneath, anard. Any questions from the? Thing before we proceed further. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. 
so when do you not do olecranon and osteotomy and at what level do you decide that i will only do olecranon and osteotomy and when you don't do olecranon osteotomy what is your preferred approach can i answer for hello yes asim yeah i will do it for a fracture which is not going below the olecranon fossa most of the time if it's above the level of uh, olecranon fossa and there is no intraarticular element then or an undisplaced intraarticular thing which i have made sure on city that it's in place otherwise low supracondylar type of fracture going up to the olecranon fossa i will do by para tricipital there i go on the pillars there and first reduce the column which is having a good read of the spikes which i can easily reduce which is not comminuted that i will reduce first hold it with my plate and, and then go on the other column and simultaneously re uh, reduce both finally and check reduction in four views so any significant intraarticular extension of the fracture and slightest displacement means you should do an osteotomy because that articular reduction is the paramount thing is key and if i'm uh, i'm not fond of i did trap uh, on few occasions and is not really very good approach for occasional user then i'll use para tricep thank you sir so i also tried trap and i didn't like that approach i thought uh, and then i switched back to like an osteotomy only any other question uh, i i'm interested to know where the uh, through this um, um the distal uh, humerus fracture when you do um chevron osteotomy whether you also experience uh, several incidences of um, uh, stiffness of the elbow and what are the things that we should do to avoid that okay i think i um, I'll, i'll give a small presentation on the radial now palsy this is what i gave about a few weeks back somewhere radial elbow palsy and shaft humerus sir uh, asim unshare i, I unshared it i did that yeah are a same you i did that yeah the the question uh, surgeon asked just now i think that is left un unanswered what he asked basically was uh, there are incidences of elbow stiffness after olecranon osteotomy could you could you spell out these steps for reduction of the stiffness that conjuncture is not correct sir that olecranon osteotomy leads to stiffness you use osteotomy as a first step to start your surgery at the end you should have a strong fixation which is good enough to allow mobilization from day one all my patients they are doing almost 10 degree 15 degree to 90 100 degree on on the same day evening also other same day evening they are doing better because the effect of decal has gone enough motor power has re returned but the sensory part is still working so there is not much pain and they are able to move very well and they have got enough confidence that yes they can do it so what yeah. you mean is very right Master. very no. right you have said the pain or the stiffness uh, related to osteotomy will occur only if your osteotomy is not fixed well okay that is one thing and uh, it is only a approach surgical approach but the main problem is the distal humerus if you have not fixed it adequately and if you have not mobilized from second or third day that elbow is bound to have some stiffness and sir it's surprising i was uh, listening to that journal club uh, american journal club so all the tycoons were their big guns 
somebody said that i give uh, immobilization for 3 days 4 days 2 days till uh, wound settles down so for the first time i realized that wound has to settle down all my life there is a crab bandage most of the time and the patient is moving without any support in an old person i'll give a slab which is removed next day and it is start mobilizing and then intermittent slab so nothing happens it never struck me that wound has to settle uh, humerus doesn't have any issue they didn't know, they didn't know that there is another typhoon from bombay <laughs> yeah no no sir sir the, the reason is that their problem is different asim uh -huh. uh, they they are smokers they are diabetic heavily diabetic yeah. they are huge where uh, you know the skin healing is a problem so probably that may be the reason why uh, and whether you mobilize on second day or after say or the fifth day it doesn't make any it doesn't make any significant difference first week it doesn't make to them the skin problems related to uh, medical issues are much more that is the reason they must be uh, avoiding mm -hmm. does that answer your question or you wanted to uh, know something else is it fine yeah i think this it's answered yes sir okay thank you so much i think karna sir is showing is ready eight to 10 minutes yeah there is nothing new in a radial parsec and occur at the practice you must accept the practical dilemma is is operation or conserve a nail or a plate And mm -hmm. now we have the radial now with the radial palsy. Uh, what we have tried to do, but now all the pundits come in without any clear cut instruction. They increase our confusion, which I believe is their job. I am trying to simplify or confuse you more. But if the patient comes with the radial palsy and the shaft of humerus, now what is the treatment for a minimally displaced shaft of humerus? minimally displaced now low energy fracture with the soft tissue envelope is intact i can so please understand what i am talking about where the soft tissue envelope is intact i can so if such fracture as a radial now passes then treat fracture and now conservatively as near 100% recovery is expected in such fracture Evidence in the radial nerve palsy also due to humeral sac fracture. If the energy of the trauma is a prognostic fracture, low energy fracture uniformly recovers, and therefore primary surgical exploration seems unnecessary. High energy fracture, neurotomesis or a severe contusion must be expected. In this case, no recovery is unfavorable, and the patient should be informed of a poor prognosis and a need for a tendon transfer. Compound fracture, high energy, any case needs surgery. They remain so explore the now one day one. So now decision making is if a medium or a high energy non-compound displaced fracture, you must be radial palsy. What to do? In simple, not compound but displaced fracture with radial nerve palsy, how to treat? Displaced fracture always needs surgery, nailing or plating. So if you are a plater for such fractures, simple. Explore the nerve, release, and plate fracture with compression. If the transverse fracture or a short oblique fracture, displace the humerus fracture with the nerve palsy. This fracture without nerve palsy also needs surgery. So no debate. Decompress nerve and fix the humerus. Now, with the nerve palsy, if you are a nailer or an interior bridge plater, now what to do? <laughs> If you are a posterior plater, then there is no issue. So my approach is: do not nail, but treat by plating after the nerve release. If a comminuted and needs a bridge plate, I suggest go posterior, release the nerve, and do a posterior bridge plate. If the nerve palsy is humerus at this level, or Wallenstein Jewish fracture, this is the one. At this level, if the palsy fracture always needs surgery. And the nerve is also trapped in that fracture. I'll go down and fix the fracture after the nerve release in every case with long metaphyseal plate, as described by Olesten and Lewis. Nerve recovery is seen in seven to six percent of both injuries. Cannot leave twenty-five percent to chance. Now I take a case of a development of the radial nerve palsy after manipulation of a closed humeral shaft. 
for mailing or entry the plating or ADP or whatever it is. Does it need immediate exploration? The primary indication for early exploration is a progressive now policy that may occur after the close reduction. Initial evaluation of the now is essential prior to any treatment and re-examine daily and assess if progressing must operate. In such situation, now could have been trapped in the fracture where the recovery is not assured or just lacerated but not trapped where it will recover spontaneously. If ever the nerve is in these two fractures, then if you wait, it may harm. So this is the only condition in which waiting can be harmful. As now may have been trapped in the bone fragment during the manipulation, which can be decompressed. So option is ideally explore immediately. During the anterior approach for an upper one-third humerus fixation or for a nailing now rarely get paralyzed. If this is occurs, it is during the manipulation or reduction clamp or can injure radial nerve. Spontaneous recovery is almost always if anatomical reduction is achieved. If you have operated and the nerve palsy occurred after that surgery, it's a difficult dilemma. Theoretically, must explore not to take any chances. Practically, second surgery for your own complication is very hard on the operating surgeon and maybe other seniors will enter the picture. My suggestion in such situation, play percentage game. 95% has a chance to recover fully without intervention. So conserve, observe if any recovery in six to eight weeks clinically and EMG. If not, consider exploration in eight to 10 weeks of a non-recovery. Immediately do not explore. One cunning trick which I already told you just now, you immobilize here, he will be able to do the extension at the PIP joint. But if he does the extension of the NP joint, now you know very well that this is not a problem. So with radial palsy, PIP joint extension is improvised, but no business. We have already spoke about it. Of the 15 radial nerve palsies, 12 anatomically intact nerves were identified with three lacerations. Radial nerve function returned in all. Well, intact now and in one future now after the plating. Due to high rate of spontaneous recovery of the radial now after closed remaining sex fracture, we recommend 16 to 18 weeks of expectant management followed by a surgical intervention. Majority recover and few who do not in four to five months explore. Author advice to conserve fracture in space fracture does not need surgery. Author does not think so because he is the only cutting the now part. Because if the author was talking about this, you are talking about only now part. While a displaced fracture of the humerus always needs surgery. So there is no debate about it. Now, if the radial nerve palsy has occurred during the posterior plating, where nerve is always explored, if you have seen the nerve intact and have not cut the nerve, do nothing. 99.9% .9 is going to recover. Nerve palsy is more likely to happen during revision surgery of a non union now, here was the fracture. This is what I was talking about. All three surgeries, he had the now palsy. First fracture, surgeon did this. Now palsy, this is what happened. Surgeon did this. Again, a now palsy. And this also gave way. So this is the third surgery I did. It's very recently I've done. And fortunately, at the end of the thing, this is the fibula. And then this is a, this is a big thing with the grafting. Fortunately, there was no now palsy. Now, the way to go about is, first fracture is far away from the now. When the fracture is far away from the now, in this case, the now is here, the fracture is here. This is comparatively easier situation. Go down, and once you diagnose the now here, now you just do nothing. Go subperiosteally, so that the you will be now will be far away. And then you will be able to avoid the now because the fracture is here. So you go down to the fracture and treat whatever. Safer way to re-explore with a non-union is grow from above virgin area and subperiosteally split the whole soft tissue from above below. So now no now will be wrapped inside. So it, this is how ultimately you put in the plate also. And things will be saved because there is a good amount of muscle which is there between the now and the part. Now, if the fracture is at the now, 
here at the now crossing. This is the one which is chances of transient party are very high in such situation. One will have to rely, really identify the now and really right up to medially where it exists in the entire compartment. Now you can you can go either just now as seen mentioned, way proximally, which is a virgin area, you can start seeing it from there and see the now. Or, or you can start seeing it from the lower end, which you have not explored earlier. Lower end you go and see it from there. Once you see the now, now it is becomes easier to like, open up. So I just start from the proximal virgin area and digitally virgin area to see the now without fibrosis around. Now having done that, identify the nerve and then above and below, same way, pick the fact from the fracture with some soft tissue. Now do not try to dissect the nerve out. Having seen it, go underneath and strip it out. Chances of transient nerve palsy are high in such fracture at the level of crossing of the radial nerve. As a small tension comes during the surgery and during putting the screws on the plate. So this is how you are. Now separate it out. And now push in the plate, put the screws, put the screws here. And here, where there is a fracture, obviously you don't put anything. Avoid the screws here. Because if you want to put it, the screws here, the nerve is, which is crossing by, it will be very much under tension. So avoid the screws there. Put screws proximally and basically that's going to be good enough. Never, never settle a night palsy, never needs exploration. Focus splint and carry on. Last is the local injection part. This is what in the Nair hospital where I was working, the, the people, war boys, when they were giving the injection, in the ladies, they'll give the brows and they'll give the injection here. And that injection quite often would hit the radial nerve if they are not aware of it. Instead of giving in the in the higher part where they will not have a problem, they will do it through the things here and then you get an injection palsy. I have seen sufficient number of them. Who gives injection there in the mid arm? But in department government hospital, almost never recover. That inside the nerve is injected and now is destroyed. Think of primary muscle transfer after a serial EMG phase over a six to eight weeks. Confirmed is no inkling of a recovery. The distal locking screws can be inserted anterior to the posterior, posterior to anterior or lateral to the medial by the open technique and may endanger the radial nerve, median nerve, musculoskeletal nerve. Now here, this is the way the radial nerve is passing in the groove. The radial nerve is at a risk in such fractures because it can be trapped inside in any of these fractures. So in terms of if can, deteriorating function is exploration. I choose plating if the radial party. If you operate it postoperatively, and sure not cut the nerve, then wait. And that I mentioned about the cutting thing. These are the few ways in which you can handle a radial nerve with the fracture humerus. Asim, you can carry on, please. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Uh, in this plates uh plate of flange is there any part of especially in any Indian version we can't we can't hear you properly Arjot you are not able to listen to you I will write the question in the chat box sir yeah, that would be fine. So, Dr. Negi, you are muted. Dr. Negi, you are muted. How are you here? Now, now we are getting. Yeah. First slide. Yeah. Is, this is not the first slide, I think. This is third. Oh. No. Can share. Uh, uh, sir, before I start, I wanted to contribute one information. Uh, Dr. Raja Sabapati, uh, uh, somebody asked this question that how do you decide whether to advise
uh, your one slide mentioned this equation. Uh, somebody asked whether to go for a exploration of now and sura now grafting for the reconstruction or tendon transfer. So his answer was that now grafting done by a competent person in adequate setups in a patient who understands that now grafting may not deliver adequate outcome. And finally, he may have to offer tendon transfer. That means two surgeries may be required. Then you uh, go for uh, now transfer, uh, now reconstruction, because the outcome will be far, far superior than tendon transfers. But if you got a financially compromised patient or a patient who is not uh, uh, willing to understand that uh, uh, for a better quality result, he should take his chance and uh, take the risk of uh, undergoing tendon transfer later on, then you do a tendon transfer. This is how he, he explained. Because for radial now, uh, a now transfer, uh, now graft done properly gives excellent outcome. The result is superior, very, very superior and very good. Should I start? Yeah, we are waiting for you. Yeah. Uh, I will make it. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about shear fractures of the capitulum and trochlea. They constitute about 1% of elbow injuries and 6% of the distal humeral fractures. Females are more likely to get them because of their increased carrying angle and osteoporotic bones. This injury pattern is caused mainly by axial compression while falling with elbow semi-flex or hyperextended or after a spontaneous reduction of a posterior lateral sublux or dislocation of the elbow. You must look for associated injuries because 40% of these patients will have injury to lateral collateral ligament complex and 30% patients can have head radius. So after do doing reduction for any elbow, you must examine under anesthesia for stability and mention the range of motion in which is stable in your notes. A few words about anatomy. Radiocapitular articulation is an integral part of lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which is important for longitudinal valgus stability. Excision of capitulum will lead to coronal plane instability, especially if MCL is torn. How to take proper x-rays? AP and true lateral view of the elbow I have shown here. Generally, they are not taken properly. You must abduct the shoulder and keep the arm like this and not like that so that you get a proper lateral view. The wrist has to be slightly above the level of the table, about 15 degrees, and the thumb should be up in a mid-prone position. On a good lateral view, Allah should overlap on the radius and capitulum like this. This is slightly higher than the elbow to compensate for normal cubitus valgus angle and thumb should be kept like, up like this. this is. Don't forget to take x-rays of the wrist and the forearm. True epi of the, the distal humerus is taken like this. Thumb should not be kept like this. Most of these patients have swelling and cannot really fully extend. So if you are taking x-ray for a suspected fracture of the distal humerus, you take the exposure in this position. And if you are suspecting a fracture in the head radius and the proximal ulna, the arm is kept like this. Please do not take an AP view keeping the arm like this. You will neither see good distal humerus nor proximal ulna in the radius. The 72-year-old female had a fall on elbow what looks like a very simple, innocuous looking fracture capitulum and surgeon might, might think that he has to just pass two headless compression screw from front to back. When CT scan is done, you see that the anterior trochlea is sheared off along with the capitulum. This is the capitulum, this is the anterior part of the trochlea which is sheared off and is gone proximally and rotated. Capitulum is also proximally migrated and rotated. Posterior part of the trochlea is fractured but hardly displaced, is in position. And if you go to the console, they can even measure the size of the fragments for you. 
and give you some idea how much length of the screws will be required. You can have an exact assessment and pass a slightly shorter screw. CT is absolute must. It shows how many fragments are present. Is there any depressed articular fragment? It helps to decide the right approach for planning surgery and the right implants also even. Type 1, non-comminuted shear fractures can be probably treated with headless compression screws alone, while type 2 and 3, which are having comminution, essentially need plates and screws for fixing them as shown here. This is the non-comminuted one where you can get away with headless compression screw. The comminuted one necessarily needs plates, screws and leg screws. The uh, choice of the screw. Most people are trained and fond of doing an AP screw. AP screws, they claim is that they protect soft tissue and better preserve the blood supply because most of the supply comes from the posterior side. The argument against will be PA screws are biomechanically superior to anterior posterior screws. AP screws, they certainly damage articular cartilage in that area where they enter the uh, fracture surface, uh, articular surface and they compromise stability sometimes by splintering the fragment. Ring has proposed to use divergent screws mainly pass from posterior to anterior. According to him, they have got better rotational control. They are thin screws passed in a divergent fashion from back to front. There is decreased risk of iatrogenic splintering. Headless compression screws are immensely useful. They leave no outside prominence, avoid impingement, and achieve excellent compression. There are papers comparing the Acutrec versus the Herbert screw. Acutrec, unfortunately, probably is not available in our country anywhere. We have got Herbert screws and the short threaded leg screws. According to this paper, Acutrec was found to be better than Herbert screw, but Helfred contradicted this view and showed that that is not true. The Herbert screw achieves equally good compression. Now the classification. This is the old classification, Brian and Morris, type 1, where there is a large osseous piece of capitulum, which you can certainly fix very well. In type 2, the articular cartilage, has got very thin shell of subchondral bone. It has separated from the main chunk and it's really difficult to fix it. And sometimes you may have to excise it. And these are the patients where people have tried mainly arthroscopic excision of the fragment. <clears throat> In Brian and Moray classification, type 3 is a severely comminuted multifragmentary fracture involving anterior part of the trochlea and the capitula. Mackey's modification is a type 1. Uh, fracture where fractures extends medially to include the trochlea. It, it fractures the capitulum and involves the lateral part of the trochlea also. So on the x-ray, you see a double bubble sign. These two arch, the, the red one is of the trochlea, lateral part, and the yellow one is from the capitulum. But the newer classification given by Duberly, it really helps to plan the surgery as well as to prognosticate. Here, the type 1 involves only capitulum, as you can see here. Type 2 is a fracture which involves the capitulum and the lateral half the, of the trochlea, but this is a single large piece. In type 3, the capitulum and the trochlea both are fractured in the anterior part, but they are separate. So, capitulum has got a separate shear fracture, trochlea is also sheared off separately, and they are separate from each other. And Type 1, a uh, type A in all these 1, 2, and 3, A is where there is no posterior combination as you can see here, and type B is where there is a posterior combination. Does the presence of posterior combination modify the treatment and prognosis in capitular and trochlear fractures? A study performed on 45 consecutive patients published showed that posterior combination certainly adversely affects the outcome. As you can see here, type A, where there is no posterior combination, fixation was only with the screws, range of motion was excellent, functional scores were very high, and the complication rate was less than 30%. While type B, where there was posterior combination, you have to use plates along with mini frag screws and the leg screws. The range of motion achieved was moderate. 
functional scores were poor, 86 versus 73, and 64% of the patients can have a complication, including increased reoperation rate. What are our surgical options for treating these shear fractures? Open reduction and internal fixation. Excision is mainly reserved for that type 2 fracture where there is a flag of cartilage with little subchondral bone, which is difficult to fix in any way. In older patients, total elbow, arthroscopic reduction and fixation for a very minimally displaced fracture or where you want to excise the type 2 cartilaginous flag. My favored approach for operating these patients is exercise lateral approach. I operate them in supine position with tunique on, on the side table. My incision is going along the lat, uh, on the lateral side along the supracondylar ridge. I palpate the ridge and then work along this ridge from lateral epicondyle higher up and three centimeter distal up to the radial head. This is my incision. And then I peel off the triceps behind and biceps and brachial radius, the whole along with neuroscular bundle in the front. This 72-year-old female had a fall on elbow, looks like simple capitular fracture. We saw the CT before, had extensive involvement of capitulum and the uh, trochlea both. Lateral approach, pain is between biceps and triceps proximally. Distally, it is between anconius and ECU. Forearm is always kept pronated to protect the posterior interosseous nerve. I do not elevate the LUCL. I tend to go anterior to this in this part. But if it's fractured, then I'll reflect it distally. My spike is superiorly on the medial column. Have to be very careful. Ulna nerve is just close there. Capitular fragment is seen. It is proximally migrated and significantly rotated, as you can see here. This is my anterior side. This is the posterior side, tip of the elbow. This is the forearm. Capitulum is devoid of any soft tissue most of the time. So dissect it and keep it on the table. Now you can see the trochlear fragment very well. This is the trochlear fragment, which you can see proximally displaced, rotated, and is certainly encroaching on the coronoid fossa. This is the front part. This is the proximal shoulder end. And here is the forearm. The trochlea is being derotated and pushed down in its bed. Sometimes I use a thumb or sometimes a blunt periosteum to push it gently down, derotating it, and then Finally, I judge my reduction at the margins of the coronoid fossa and at the articular surface. So, anterior trochlea now has almost been reduced and there is a void. You can see here the capitulum will fit in this void in extension. Now, first K-wire which I pass is this one. This starts proximally in the humeral metaphysis, slightly posterior. You can see a bump of towel there. That is to lift the arm. So when I'm passing this wire, I'm going from proximal to distal, slightly posterior, and aiming anteriorly to engage the trochlea in this part. This is how it goes. Proximal to distal from metaphysis, engaging the anterior part of the trochlea. These are the two K wires holding my trochlea from the metaphysis. Even if they go through the fossa, it's fine because finally you will take them out. They are not going to be there for forever. Having done that, I put my capitulum back and pass this K wire from uh, lateral side to medial side. So the trochlea is again engaged to the intact medial column, which is here. Then I put back my capitulum here and pass an anterior posterior wire in the capitulum, which subsequently will be replaced with a 2.4 millimeter headless compression screw. This is my wire number four, which will be, which is going in the capitulum and will be replaced by 2.4 mm headless compression screw. So this is my temporary construct. And then I can check my reduction in multiple views, at least four views, maybe more. If I'm happy, then I replace the capitular K wire with a headless compression screw. When uh, I'm doing that, I hold my reduction with a towel clip. Otherwise, headless compression screw tends to uh, rotate that or splinter that easily. So this towel clip is on the posterior margin of the lateral column and holding the capitulum anteriorly so that it doesn't rotate. 
and then I use a lateral column French locking plate and position it such so that my screws I can pass in the from back to front locking bolts I can pass from back to front through this locking plate engaging different parts of the sheared trochlea and the capitulum. Pass the distal and the lateral most screw of this plate first. So I pass a guide wire and check whether my plate position has to change. I don't pass the bolt directly or drill it first. I put my plate and pass a 1.8 mm K wire and check it on the TV. And if I have to make the adjustment for height of the patient, moving it distally, proximally, medially, laterally, I do that before and then only go ahead with the passing the bolts. All these bolts, they have been passed through this plate. And sometimes I don't use a sleeve. I just use freehand drilling with K wires, which hardly ever penetrates the anterior cortex. It's just coming close to the anterior surface of the cortex, but I pass it in different directions so that screws pass through this plate. They are engaging the anterior part of the capitulum and trochlea at multiple places. Having done that, I use a 2.7 millimeter or 2.4 millimeter locking plate for lateral column of the lower end of radius. A stolid plate of radius is twisted almost 60 to 70 degree. I twist it in such a manner that in the distal part, this is distal. Distal parts, they are screws are going in the anterior part of the capitulum and trochlea. And proximally, I pass the screws from back to front, front to back in the metaphysis. So here they go. And anterior to posterior and here they are going lateral to medial. So this is used as an anti-glide plate, sort of. Take the range of motion on table. This 70 plus lady had almost the full range on table. This is the final picture. And she was allowed intermittent mobilization. A slab was given for almost three weeks, but slab was removed every day from day one onwards. And she could move it, do it actively. They are taught and again put back the slab. Dressing and the slab, they are separate. And she almost went on to have a full range. You can have a fractured lateral epicondyle with LCL injury along with a shear fracture of the trochlea and the capitulum, which is severely comminuted. 49 year old male, fall on out stage and no neurovascular deficit. You can see that the trochlea is severely comminuted along with the lateral column. The medial column is certainly intact, and lateral part of the trochlea also has many pieces you can see on these slides there. This is the trochlear comminution. Even the posterior cortex is comminuted but not displaced. This is how the 3D CT looks. Posterior you can see that there is not much damage there. The same approach but here fortunately the lateral epicondyle was fractured, taking LUCL with it. So this whole thing was reflected distally and it gave an excellent window to the entire elbow from extensile lateral approach. This is the capitulum. We tried to reduce fracture capitulum and the trochlea together, but it's virtually impossible. So finally, I failed and I took out this capitulum and kept it on the table. This is the capitulum which goes on the table. Now I can see my lateral part of the trochlea very well. This is the lateral part of the anterior trochlea, which is displaced proximally and rotated. Use the same tricks, thumb, blunt periosteum, to try to derotate, push it down, bring it to its position, check reduction on the coronoid fossa and at the level of joint. And then once you have reduced it, fix it with 1.8 mm K wires, to medial column. The K wire starts here and goes from lateral part of the trochlea to the intact medial column. That's my first K wire. Here you can see the anti bed of the capitulum. Trochlear reduction is looking good. And these are the wires. This is my first K wire. This is my second K wire. Fixing the lateral part of the trochlea to the medial intact column. And they are brought out on the medial side here. So they are flush. Tip is seen here. Now I can put my capitulum there. I mean, reduce the trochlea. It comes here. And the wires which I have taken out on the medial side, I can pass them through the capitulum. Advance the two wires already passed in the medial column and the trochlea, trochlea into capitulum to complete your articular uh, reconstruction. Uh, 
here the wires have come out then i reduce my lucl with comminuted lateral epicondyle in the remaining slot there and then multiple k wires this fourth and fifth k wire they are fixing this comminuted lateral epicondyle along with lucl attachment to the metaphysis so this is my temporary construct now and then i replace that with locking plate again the flanged one which is my favorite here bolts are passed from posterior to anterior in different parts most of the time free hand without using a sleeve and i use this flange also so these screws 2.4 mm almost 40 to 45 mm long they go from lateral metaphys uh, lateral column in the capitulum anterior part trochlea and up to the medial column sometimes again same precaution first pass a guide wire in this distal and the lateral most hole to make sure that your plate height is good that guide wire will tell you whether you have to move the plate proximal distal medial lateral if this is correct rest of the things will fall in place and this flange should not hurt the patient it should be flush on the board if required you can even mold it out again the same anti glide plate Scarlet plate twisted, 60, 70 degree. This is how I twist it, and screws here. They are going in the capitulum and trochlea. Here they are going back from front to back. This is the temporary intraop picture, and this is the final construct. Again, the same thing. This patient had stronger bones, so more aggressive mobilization, and. Has gone on to have a full range of motion. There are more approaches described. People often use anterolateral approach and not the extensile lateral approach, which can be used very well for fractures without posterior combination. Anterolateral, there is no damage to LUCL. There is no extensile lag. Excellent visualization of even medial part because you are starting more anteriorly is easier to visualize the medial part. and screws can be passed perpendicular to the fracture plane these are the claimed advantages here incision starts 7 cm proximal to elbow flexion crease and the plane is between biceps and brachioradius so that's an internervous plane at elbow curved laterally to avoid the flexion crease and then continue distally along medial border of the brachioradius here between brachioradius and the pronator so again the internervous plane pronator by median and recurrent is by radial so uh, it's a very good approach uh, you, but here you have to identify and protect the radial now all the time in the extensile lateral i hardly ever bother to detect the uh, look for the radial now uh, and there are no problems because the muscles are nicely protecting you in the anterolateral one you can peel off brachialis medially to expose the capsule and the entire fracture but anterior lateral has got great limitation if there is a comminuted posterior cortex and you need plate is impossible to put a plate through anterior lateral approach and risk of neurovascular injury is also slightly higher though is not very common in raju vashya series 15 patients only one radial nerve palsy which finally recovered people have described two incision techniques as shown here lateral and the anterior for fractures with extreme medial extension incision is over the supracondylar ridge distal between ecrb and edc you have to stay anterior and the medial incision is somewhere here people have even tried anterior approach is transverse incision about 3 to 4 cm at the elbow crease between biceps tendon and the neurovascular both planes have been described you take the neurovascular entirely on the medial side or you can push them on the lateral side depending on the part of the particular surface you want to see having done that you split the brachialis where your city has shown you that you want to attack that area and then make a longitudinal cut in the fracture uh, capsule fracture is supposedly reduced under vision and fixed but i never dared to use this approach because i am extremely happy with my extensile lateral approach and can see almost the entire distal articular surface as i will show you in the next patient this patient probably with this type of ct was a suitable case for two incision technique or maybe by doing with a transverse approach 
fracture going right across, not much of combination, posterior cortex intact, but uh, capitulum was comminuted, of course. Here the, you can see that the capitulum is having three pieces, one, two, three. But trochlea is not bad and it's going right across up to the medial column. So either two incision or maybe a transverse approach. Uh, because we were familiar with extensile lateral and very happy, you can see that the posterior cortex is intact, polygonal fossa is clear, capitulum is comminuted. So we use the same extensile approach. Uh, we first push the trochlear fragment down. Here, we assess the reduction on the margins of the coronoid fossa and the level of, at the distally at the level of the articular surface. It should be absolutely congruent. Hold it with K wires passed from lateral column into the trochlea. The capitulum has been kept on the table, and this lateral part of the trochlea wires are passed from the fracture surface into the intact medial column. Then capitulum was put back here. Second K wire is passed in the trochlea in AP direction. This is the second K wire. Second K wire and the third K wire is passed in the capitulum. So these wires are going back to front. Here wires have penetrated, but I try not to pierce the posterior cortex, stay within the bone. So there is no risk of having longer screws. And then one by one, the K wires were replaced with uh, headless compression screw. And doing this in for the capitulum, I hold it with a clamp so that this fragment doesn't rotate. There's only one screw which is going to go into capitulum here. So replace all these. So there are five headless compression screw. And through the same extensile lateral approach, we could see up to here and pass the uh, screw. Here. So I don't use... Uh, other approaches, I'm very familiar and comfortable. And it can show you up to this medial column. We have passed this screw through the same approach. Uh, then again, I use the uh, uh, same French plate to buttress the comminuted lateral column. As you can see there, there is a lot of posterior involvement also. So here is the plate and that's her range of motion. And that's she at the end of probably three months or something like that. Uh, if there is a significant posterior involvement, you ought to use an olecranon osteotomy. Uh, or if there is significant medial extension of the fracture. Double layer ignites this olecranon osteotomy for all type 3 and some of the type 2 fractures. A contraindication will only be older patient where on table you may have to resort to a total elbow. You simply can't fix the fracture. So that may, might be a contraindication for doing an olecranostotomy. Extensile lateral versus olecranostotomy, there was no difference in the outcome according to literature. There are multiple papers on this issue and they claim same outcomes. This is the patient which Dr. Tanna just now showed. Young male patient, fresh fracture. That's his x-ray. This is the type of comminution he has got. Trochlea comminuted. Capitulum also badly committed. There is a split, depressed fracture of the head radius. This is Duberlase type 3B, Pakka. Then this is the axial 2Ds. We chose a posterior approach, lateral position. And now you can see that it's contused. It was seen and left in its bed. No more dissection done on the medial column after this. Two big pieces of the lateral part of the trochlea, they were free. They go on the table here, like this. Then there were five people suggesting me to fit this Rubik cube, which piece should go where and this looks better. So they were fixed on the table. And there is a paper on this. On table reconstruction of the capitulum and trochlea gives excellent results by Rudy and Sommer. Another paper by Singh. Here is the empty bed of the uh, medial column and the trochlea, medial part, intact medial column. You can see the, you can hold it with a barbrugi, metaphysis, and rotate the humerus. So you are seeing almost back and front both of the, and this piece was fitted here, and the K wires were uh, advanced on the medial column here, fixing lateral trochlea to the medial column. And then 
wires started going from articular surface to the metaphysis there. So this is my temporary reduction. Wire number one and two are here, going like this. Then wire number three and four are here, three and four, fixing articular surface to the metaphysis up. This trochlea was hollow and this much of the cancellous bone we could pack in this trochlea, so gently pushing it. And then there was a small third piece of the trochlea which was fixed here, punched in, and then it was fixed with a 1 mm lost K wire. This is the tip of that lost K wire we can see here. And yeah, this is the fifth K wire. Fixing the third piece of trochlea. Depressed head radius, the annular ligament was not cut, it was only seen. It was gently nudged back in its place, lifted, and then held in place with two headless compression screw passed in different directions. And then finally, we reduced the lateral epicondyle, used the lateral column LCP fixed with K wires. Again, the height adjusted, replaced the long K wire with three millimeter headless compression screw. This one. This long K wire was fixed with a headless compression screw. And that's the final picture. And then we reduced the olecranon, fixed it with a tension band. There was some combination in the olecranon also. So use the recon plate to support that tension band. And that was mobilization on day one. You can see the amount of soft tissue damage there, but gently mobilized four months and this is almost now two years plus. There is no osteonecrosis. The indication for total elbow will be unrepairable comminuted fractures in patients above 65 or maybe 70 with pre-existing arthritis. Better functional outcome in total elbow group at two years when that was compared with osteosynthesis. I out of the 20 in ORIF group underwent total elbow intraop because of severe combination and the poor fixation achieved, avoid osteotomy if the total elbow is even anticipated. Arthroscopic assisted reduction can be done for excising the very small fragments or undisplaced non-comminuted or minimally displaced fracture, not undisplaced, minimally displaced uh, non-comminuted fractures can be reduced under arthroscopic control and may be fixed with the help of headless compression. So very small place for that. The complications in these severe injuries are innumerable. You can have contractures, stiffness, non-union is not uncommon, almost 10%. Ulnar nerve injury can occur, rarely a radial nerve, especially with the anterolateral approach. HO can occur in about 4%. Indomethacin is advised in the literature. I don't use it. There is not much support and most experts nowadays do not recommend it. Prophylactic uh, radiation also is not practiced, though it's talked about in the books and post-traumatic arthritis is not uncommon, but because an upper limb joint, so the function stays good for many, many years. Infection can ruin a good surgery. Here is my young patient, RTA, post-op, head infections around, uh, around 10 to 14 days later on after the first surgery, he came for an infection, very severely traumatized elbow, lots of cables, nicely reduced, mobilized, but Around day 12, came for suspected infection, washed, debrided, that is given according to the sensitivity. Fracture went on to heal, no sinus, but 11 months post-op, he had a stiff elbow, only this much of range under anesthesia. Arthrolysis done, part of the implant removed, achieved almost full range intraoperatively. And post-op, he had a decent function, not very great, but almost 20 to, I think, 100 degree flexion, 105. Continuing with the complications, AVN is rare, pain or valgus systematic, cubitus valgus, tardy ulnar palsy can occur. You can have even distal radio ulnar joint subluxation, especially if you excise the small <coughs> unfixable fragment of the capitulum. As you can get this type of thing with Head radius excision, if there is a damage to interosseous uh, membrane, you can have a DRUJ subluxation. Same can happen if you excise capitulum and there is extensive asex laprosity type of injury. 
so that is about yeah, about post op and the rehab you should achieve fixation which is stable enough enough to allow you early active range of motion sub optimal fixation you can support with his elbow braces lcl injury mobilize in pronation when you give this hinged elbow brace if you are having a lcl injury you keep the forearm in the pronation and if there is a mcl injury you mobilize in supination fractional contracture in early post op period you can use turnbuckle splints uh, they are commercially available ones now uh, you can get them even online now that's all sir. thank you asim yes sir any question to asim anything you want to add up chandak एक्सीलेंट प्रेजेंटेशन माई वाली एक्सपीरियंस अबाउट दिस फ्रैक्चर इज दे आर रियली डिफिकल्ट फ्रैक्चर सो सो वेन एवर वेन एवर वी टेक अप दिस फ्रैक्चर इट इज अ चैलेंजिंग इंजुरी कीप एक्स्ट्रा टाइम कीप गुड टूर्निंग अवेलेबल एंड गुड पेशेंस एंड ऑल सर वराइटी ऑफ हार्डवेयर All mini fragment and yeah. keep, keep all, everything ready. Yeah. yeah, keep all hardware ready from small fragment plates to multiple K wires, even point six, point eight mm K wires is also very useful. Keep good benders, good nose pliers, and 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 start this as the first case. And still, then at the end of surgery, many times you may not have, may not have that desired uh, scientific goal achieved. But uh, these are difficult fractures. That is what uh, my. And sir, another thing which makes huge difference is get a good quality CT scan. Yes. Get a CT scan of your place of uh, place of your choice, and especially where you can go and sit on the console. Yes. And play with the images. And I totally agree with you. There are some yeah. CT scan centers where we develop more confidence. They give us the image what we want. Yes, agree. Sir, I have a question to Chandak, sir. Yeah. Sir, what is your preferred approach for uh, capital of fracture, extensor lateral or lateral, and uh, do you See, put antero posterior screw or PA screw? I, I think uh, what Doctor Negri said was excellent. Same approach. I think most of the surgeons would use this approach only. There are very limited indication for uh, antero lateral, the anterior uh, approach to elbow. <laughs> very rare indication because laterally you can elevate and raise and put a bone spike and see anteriorly everything the problem is if you want to fix with a anterior posterior herbert screw then you do not get a good trajectory that is the only problem so you have to develop certain special instrument by which your hand goes bit more vertical and then you are able to pass a anterior posterior screw both are fine if it is isolated simple capital of fracture i think pa screws suffice which also is more which also is a more uh, biological way it, it it preserving everything just at the during the surgery keep on having the full range of motion and at, at times you will find that the capitulum is jumping anterior i am I'm sorry, I I I muted you. Can you please unmute yourself, Chandra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, what Doctor Harjot was asking, what approach? So I also go with the same approach, the lateral approach to humerus distal end, and we have to develop certain two or three special trick instruments to get the good view. A deep right angle narrow retractor is my preferred one, one or two, and uh, long sleeves are also useful here. Otherwise, the tissues tend to get coiled. And keep all the Herbert screws sizes available, all array of instruments available. That is what is my uh, experience and requirement. Uh, Chandak sir. Yeah. Uh, hello. One, one cheat cheating trick. The most Indian Herbert screws now they have become decent in quality, but their screwdriver is lousy. Two and four Herbert screw screwdriver is lousy. So use an imported set screwdriver. You can use an Indian screw. The screw is good enough, but the screwdriver is very well. It just splinters the fragment. Yes. And that long screw also is very important. One of my slides you saw that wires got tangled. It was all twisted. So that was because the screw was not there. So that is very important to use the screw so that wires do not hurt other soft tissue. 
and they don't get trapped. Mm -hmm. Other thing is that uh, AP screw should be, I, I feel AP screw, screw should be bent. When I pass post zero enter screw, I make my passage with a K wire and do not even come out of, on the articular surface. I can see that tip is about to come, stop there, measure it and pass a screw which does not even hurt the articular cut. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I think Dr. Sangeet also has a beautiful presentation yeah. on the same subject. I had heard him in the meeting and I was mesmerized. Yes, Dr. Sangeet. I, I can, most of the things uh, he has covered, uh, only a case in which I had to do a revision, uh, probably that would add some information. Sangeet, I think you can go ahead with full presentation. And you yes, can be on this. Keep, keep I understand you 10 minutes, am I right? Yeah. Hello, good. sir. Uh, uh, sir, the, my question to uh, Nagi, sir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, you have passed in one case uh, to wire from uh, lateral to medial. Yeah. So, what precaution you are taking to protect the ulna now in such uh, passing the wire? Look, this, this is a shear fracture. So, shear yes, fracture sir. is anterior 50%. So the wire is going in the front part of that thing. The now at that level, at the level of joint is definitely behind that. And so another question is, uh, as uh, these are the shear fracture, but here all the case managed with only uh, lateral to medial screw. Uh, there are only uh, hardly few cases in which you have put anterior to posterior screw for proctia particularly. So, how did you manage that by just putting uh, lateral no, to medial no, screw? No, 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 no. We talked about AP screws and PA screws. So, almost in all cases, there are one or maybe two AP screws and one lady I showed there were five AP screws, uh, Herbert screws. So, yes, sir, but uh, rather the, than AP, no, ra rather than AP, I am passing through that flanged lateral column plate, screws without using a sleeve for the locking uh, locking bolt, and passing freehand where I my, uh, want, want my bolt to go. So that plate allows me to fix it from back to front. And there are some, uh, it's a multi-planar fixation. Posterior to anterior, then there is a flange fixing from Bank from lat buttressing and fixing from lateral column to the medial column, some 40 uh, millimeter screw I can pass sometimes. And then there is an anti glide plate again. There is too much of Loire child to allow mobilization even in the first two, three days. Even no, sir, are you, uh, are you putting a screw from posterior to anterior through a plate? Through the plate, yeah, that lateral column plate. The bolts are not going. Uh, through, most of the bolts are not going through the locking sleeve. They are, the plate is used as a buttress and I pass my bolts using a 1.8 mm, that's a 2.4 mm plate. That, that basic distal plate is 2.4 mm plate. So the K wire is used 1.8 mm and the screws through the holes of the plate are M where I want them to go. And it works beautifully. Okay. Different parts of the trochlea and the capitulum, they are having a bite through the plate from behind to anterior and lateral to medial. Okay, sir. I, I would suggest you you give your whole talk. Yes, sir. That is a good one. I suggest you give your whole talk. <coughs> I'll try to cover what is not covered. Yeah. yeah. So, so show, the, show, show all these slides. Okay. So this was a 35 years old boy. He was yes. right-handed. Sangeet, if you try to cut short here and there, you won't be able to convey the, the way. Okay, I can, okay. Uh, I was so mesmerized by your talk. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, this was, he had a vehicular accident uh, in 2018. And uh, that is his CT was. And uh, what you can see here is from the posterior size, the entire lateral condyle is fractured along with the shear fracture which is seen on the left side where you can see a large fragment of the trochlea 
even the capitulum is uh, in pieces uh, in uh, two major fragments and there is a posterior element of comminution so this is uh, a part of the shear fracture where you have a comminution of the posterior cortex and uh, <clears throat> this is how it was fixed by a posterior approach the surgeon has fixed by a plate where he could fix the lateral condyle but he could not address the anterior part you can see the double arc sign wherein that means the trochlea and even the capitulum has not been captured by the plate now just now what asim was trying to explain you is uh, when you have a posterior comminution when you have a posterior comminution you cannot put a interfrac screw you cannot put a lag screw from posterior to anterior because the posterior cortex is not intact it is comminuted so what you are supposed to do is you are supposed to use a plate as a scaffold and through that you create a posterior cortex and through that you try to lag the capitulum in its anatomical position so that is what he was trying to tell you yeah, hope i am clear about it now yeah now uh, this is uh, where he was at 3 months uh, he was his elbow was stiff painful and even after physiotherapy for 3 months there was no significant change so we repeated the ct scan and uh, now if we analyze what went wrong is whether the surgical approach taking a posterior approach was it wrong uh, was there something wrong in the fixation where uh, uh, or pro probably in the fixation part the capitulum and trochlea uh, were entirely missed and second thing was understanding of this complex fracture was not done adequately before fixing them and for that what you need is you have to understand the significance of the posterior comminution and you must read this article by james duberley it is published it is a free uh, article it is published in jbgs where he describes three different types and these are where you have a simple capitulum fracture the posterior cortex is intact in type 1 in type 2 uh, the posterior cortex is again uh, may be intact to be but the fragment involves the trochlea and type 3 is uh, where the trochlea is comminuted the capitulum is also comminuted and the posterior cortex is comminuted so our fracture which was treated uh, by somebody else was this type 3b where there was comminution of the capitulum comminution of the posterior cortex and of the trochlea and if you now analyze the ct now uh, here is the fracture where the posterior side the posterior part of the distal humerus is totally intact so that means the olecranon fossa the articulation of the trochlea posteriorly is intact so what you have is a comminution on the radial side on the lateral side and the fracture always runs anteriorly and that is why through the capitulum and trochlea and that is why it is a shear fracture a vertical fracture involving the capitulum and trochlea so basically the simple fractures have the posterior cortex intact and the complicated fractures the comminuted fractures they have the involvement of the posterior cortex so these are two major uh, differences in between simple and uh, comminuted fractures so what are the different surgical approaches uh, dr asim mentioned about all the approaches but what is practical is we need only these three approaches the cocker's approach in which if the lateral collateral ligament is intact we try to preserve it and you can work by taking a longer incision on the anterior side and you can have exposure of the ca entire capitulum and the trochlea right up to uh, that uh, almost 3/4 of the trochlea is visible so this approach is suitable for the fractures which involve uh, in this a picture a shear fractures which involve half of the trochlea and the capitulum so these are the one which 
you require a caucus lateral collateral preserving approach if you have a <clears throat> if you want a larger exposure that means you want to see the medial hinge the medial hinge of the trochlea that is the medial border of the trochlea then you require a larger exposure that is a caucus extensile approach wherein you extend the incision release the lateral collateral ligament and then you have the exposure of entire capitulum the entire trochlea and in which you can address both this most of these fractures so the third variety that is where the posterior cortex is comminuted it is very very rare or those which have comminution of the capitulum and the trochlea again these are very rare and in them you require a olecranon osteotomy wherein uh, you can have you can see the uh, figure c here the end on view so you can have a entire exposure of the distal trochlea as well as the capitulum by the olecranon osteotomy so the dictum is whenever you have comminution uh, the standard approach what we are used to practice that that is the olecranon osteotomy now this is the post op ct of this patient and you can see the unfixed capitulum and the trochlear fragment now at 3 months has migrated superiorly so what we did here uh, is you can see that how bad is the articular surface and how much is the comminution on the capitular side so what we did was a posterior approach uh, olecranon osteotomy we removed the plate and even after olecranon osteotomy remember the olecranon osteotomy gives only 56% exposure to the articular surface that is you can see only 60% of the trochlea and the uh, uh, capitulum now what do we do if we want to see more so what you do is you completely flex the elbow so you have little more exposure or you can see little better the capitulum and the trochlea so to visualize flex that elbow little more now what happens is uh in this the capitulum and the trochlea has migrated superiorly and it is very difficult to pull it back so what you can do is you can do a release of the lateral collateral ligament that is the only structure which will not allow you to see the anterior side so having done the olecranon osteotomy what you do is come on the lateral side release the lateral collateral ligament from the epicondyle if it is a fresh fracture you don't need that because uh, that is already uh, a part of the avals lateral condyle so uh, here what we did after releasing that you can see the video here so you can rotate entirely the lateral collateral ligament has been released from the epicondyle and then with the clamp you can rotate the distal humerus and then see where is the uh, how uh, you can reduce the capitulum as well as the trochlea so what is hinged is the only ulnar collateral ligament which is remaining on the medial side so at the end after you have exposed after you have fixed resuture back the lateral collateral ligament to its anatomical position so this is another approach in which you can have a good vision of the fixed articular fragments of uh, shear fragments of the capitulum and trochlea now uh, this is how you get uh, increased exposure on the lateral side so that you can work on the anterior side and uh, fix it the way asim has described now you can see here this is the medial condyle this is the medial hinge of the trochlea this is uh, the entire trochlea and the capitulum the posterior side that is marked as 3 and 3 is the non articular side of the capitulum and your plate can rest almost up to here up to the articular surface so uh, i think uh, uh, jesse jupiter has described this classification where he classified a uh, distal humerus in five fragments uh, one is the shear fracture uh, uh, four is the posterior part of the trochlea two is the uh, medial half of the trochlea and three is a non articular part of the capitulum so that is where 
your fracture lies usually if it is involving the entire capitulum and the trochlea. So after having temporarily, uh, after pulling the capitulum and the trochlear fragment, this is how we could get the reduction. Uh, the uh, by a posterior approach, we have isolated the ulnar nerve, which is on the medial side. We fixed the articular fragment of the trochlea. We started from the medial side, and then we moved to the capitulum, which was comminuted. After disc engaging the fragment, they were pulled down. And since we have released the lateral collateral ligament, the exposure was very, very easy. So, so this is how at the end it was. We fixed that with a small lag screws to get a good articular reduction of the trochlea. And then this is the combination of the posterior side. We used a plate on the posterior side. This is how it was fixed. And then this plate is a, a scaffold on the comminuted area and through which we are going to pa pass some more screws to capture the capitulum so that now you have an anatomical reconstruction uh, of the distal humerus like this. And the whatever was remaining has been grafted. Uh, so at the end, once you have completed the fixation, then suture back the released LUCL to the isometric point along with the common extensor. That is the post-op X-ray of this patient where you can see how well it has been reconstructed. And that is his uh, picture, intra picture, where there is no instability. He has a good extension and flexion the elbow in complete extension and inflection at the end of the surgery. But in this revision surgery, you don't get back the same range of movement. So this is how it was at six weeks. And this is at about four months. Patient uh, uh, before lockdown, he went to Singapore. Uh, and uh, from there, he has sent a video where at six months where he had about 30 to 40 degrees of flexion deformity and a good function, uh, a functional arc of the right elbow. He, after that, I, have, I don't have any contact with him. Uh, he must have improved because we have reconstructed his uh, distal humerus well. So uh, that is about uh, that case which I wanted to share and bring about points which have been not covered or which has been uh, missed by Asi. Lovely. Excellent, Sam. Excellent. I think that solves the question of the person who asked, how do you manage the trajectory of AP fixation? So I think that question is answered by your presentation. Uh, no, no, sir. The question is, you can put a screw for capital number. How to put a screw for trochlea from plate? I, yeah. No, no, no. no. It's an indirect fixation, oblique plane, two different planes can also give a fixation. So here, a locking screw from two or three or a non-locking screw. So it is basically multi-directional, multi-axial fixation, which provides enough stability because there is no load bearing on this axis. So you don't need exact AP fixation. No, you his have... sir, his question is, the plane is such that uh, if you have to pass an interfrag, you have to pass it anterior posterior. So I how do point. we get that trajectory? Now, if you have done an olecranon osteotomy, you can pass a headless screw and let it be under the cartilage. So that solve your problem. Your lag screw will be perpendicular to the fracture. Yeah, but even so for the trochlea also. Yes, yes. The trochlea for... also. Yes. Even for trochlea also. Yes. Yeah. Headless compression is through. So you can put it through the joint. Yeah. You can put it through the cartilage. No, no, through the plate. I am what I am asking. No, no, no. You see, the oh, trochlea sorry. is never comminuted. It is a capitulum. The posterior cortex oh, is comminuted. So that the is sir, what I am asking. Shear. The trochlea is a shear fracture. Yes, sir. To the anterior cortex. Yes, sir. So, sir, Negus sir, the uh, Negus case in which he haven't to put the anteroposterior screw for trochlea also. So that is what I was asking. Okay. L listen, all 
the case which i showed all the five screws right up to the medial side could be passed front to back but as chandak sahab said they are not per exactly at 90 degree they are some some of them are at 70 degree and if you are so keen to pass at 90 degree what literature suggests is you use the extensile lateral approach which chandak sahab and me are using and add a medial incision on the medial column you take an incision and dissect from that side also so or or i'll put it this way one third part which sangeet yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, see, see the, these are the articular arti where you have to bring back the articular fragments to its normal position so that interfragmentary compression you don't require so you need not be always perpendicular to the fracture site so this can be okay. possible also one more point is after having clamped with the uh, yeah. reduction clamp from anterior side once everything is in position the radial head and the coronoid and the olecranon keeps that well aligned also so you you don't have a direct shear load bearing there and you are mobilizing Uh, off weight bearing you are not putting hand onto the surface okay sir and chandra sir if lateral epicondyle is fractured you can just open like a book as sangeet showed you can open the book on the mc yeah. and these are difficult fractures you have to accept yeah, it these are very difficult fractures but these are rare also yes. commonest are the simple capitulum yes. and involving half of the trochlea yes i think that's so the posterolateral plate often is prominent uh, or the flange of that plate is prominent is there any good make uh, indian make that is better sir showed that in his presentation sir showed the trick of putting it more medially so that it doesn't blanch out and and occasionally molding that is what is the trick no harjo the commonest keep, 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 keep from more than one manufacturer everybody makes his own plate Uh, Harjo, the problem is uh, the exposure of the capitulum or the posterior surface is not adequate most of the time. So it should rest between the non-articular surface and it should go that down. Then only it is going to fit anatomically. Okay, thank Am I you, clear? Sir. Yes, sir. Usually, usually we don't release the soft tissues uh, of the non-articular part. in my slide i have shown where is a non articular part and where is a articular part so most of the posterior surface is non articular mm -hmm. capitulum is is anterior so we don't dissect that lower down we try to put the plate little superiorly and that is where the problem lies the flange doesn't meet uh, engage where it should be or neither your plate is sitting anatomically on the lateral surface so forget about vascularity dissect more yes the fixation and mobilize early i think this would be the next mm -hmm. points and chandak sir two more information if money is no concern then the synthesis variable angle plate is very low profile very strong and is obviously variable angle another good plate is from merrill which is thin but strong yes. enough clear the stresses some indian companies have copied which is very thick and surgeon is in a hurry to put the plate and fix it spend 5 minutes 10 minutes in precise placement of it because you will have to live with it for one year you can't take it out so spend enough time there don't encroach on the olecranon fossa don't allow the flange to hurt the patient if it is hurting on the table it will hurt post operatively more so i think i would request many of the participants to kindly share one one fixations of this in the next meeting or into the group to so let us assess how how comfortable people different are people do it and do it let us see that so that's fine next time we'll yeah. see at least five people presenting from the participants and uh, and i think uh, there is no need to really nominate please please volunteer and participate it is the best time what you will get for the judgment of your surgeon yes 
Thank you very much. Sir. Do you have any... one, one, one case, Dr. Javed will present. Huh? I was there on the table. I know the case. I'll make the PPT and give it to him. <laughs> that is his case. No, no, he will present. We will listen to him. He is the operating surgeon. But he is very shy of making the PPT and the, so case is his. He is the operating surgeon. I was the assistant. Okay. Nicely done. Very nicely done. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir.